I'm curious. I'm just how many people have have heard the show? There's no reason you should have, because oh my gosh, it's so weird to me that you guys hear it over here. <laughs> a show called This American Life. Um, I've tried to, I've been trying to explain what the show is to people these last few days, and I've found that it's actually kind of tricky. <laughs> um, but just the basics, I mean, we uh, are a public radio show. Um, we air on about 600 stations um, around the US. We, were all, we also air in Canada and Australia, and actually as of last week on the BBC. Um, and we have about two million listeners on the radio in the States, and then also the most downloaded podcast on iTunes, so another million listeners there, which I guess is how you guys would hear it here. Um, I'm just going to play you some stuff from the show and talk about it and like talk about the craft of radio, because I think that's fun. And if you guys have questions at all, like just raise your hand. Let's keep it informal. Um, and uh, yeah, don't feel, just feel free to interrupt me at any point. Um, so our show is kind of based on a basic idea, which is that there's this very simple thing that can happen with a story that's just engaging. So if I were to say to you something like, two days ago, I went to the airport. I got on the plane. I sat down. Soon I heard the engine running. Nothing has actually happened. That's like the most boring story ever, but there's like a momentum to that, just that this happened, and then that happened, and then this happened. And that's kind of the basic building block of our show, um, whether it's a tiny little personal story or a large investigative piece that we've spent a year on. Um, just the personal tiny anecdote that just one thing happened, and then another thing happened, and then another thing happened. Um, so I'm going to play you kind of a pure example of that. Um, this is from a, a show... Uh, that was called Cringe. Um, it's about this guy named Joel. Uh, Joel worked at an office where nev every now and then the office manager would bring her nine-year-old to work. Um, he was a good kid, kind of tomboyish. And she would just kind of help out around the office. She would pass mail out. And over the, over the time that I was there, she and I developed this really this kind of teasing relationship. She would come into my office and she would drop my mail off and stick her tongue out at me and I would sort of fake chase her down the hallway or something. And, you know. That's sweet. Um, yeah, yeah, she's an incredibly sweet kid. And so there's this day when uh, it's early in the morning, I've arrived at the office, and, uh, and I go into the bathroom. Um, and when I come out of the bathroom, I have my glasses in my shirt pocket rather than on my head. And I look down this hallway and I see um, this small person walking towards me. And I then um, get down and start to crab walk towards her. So I, so I sort of go down on my haunches and, um, and put my hands up as if they're claws and kind of waddle, waddle towards her. So by the way, no one's turning the radio off at this point. <laughs> and as I'm waddling towards her, I say in this kind of creepy voice, Oh no, I can't believe you're here today. <laughs> and then at that moment, as, as I say... Today, she comes into focus. And I realize, in fact, it's not at all the young girl who I thought it was, but it's, in fact, one of our interns, a business intern who, um, uh, who is a, a, a midget. <laughs> and so she comes into focus, and I see her, and I'm horrified, and I go bolt upright, and I stand up, and I say, oh, my, my God, I'm terribly sorry. I... I, I I thought you were somebody else. And I think to myself, who could she possibly think that somebody else is? <laughs> and I wonder at the time, should I have tried to explain it to her? And it seems to me like one of those situations where it only gets worse the more you try to explain it. The only thing I could do is, in fact, apologize and then end all contact with her forever right there. <laughs> Um, very basic, right? It's, it's the way you tell a story at a bar. And that's kind of, I mean, we will tell people that when we interview them, even if it's about a serious topic, um, people will be like, so what's this interview going to be like? And I'll say, I, I want you to talk to me like we were having drinks. Um, and and it's, just, it's just simple, you know? It's just, this thing happened, then I walked down the hallway, then I crouched, <laughs> then I... Then I started making weird faces. Then I realized who she was. So it's just action, 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 
there's a revelation when he realizes, oh, actually, it's not <laughs> the nine-year-old. Um, and then he reflects on it, and he says, he says, I just realized that like I was never going to be able to talk to her again. And that's the basic structure of, of everything we do. Here's another one. Um, this is from a show called Kid Logic, uh, which is a, an episode all about the ways we our children perceive the world that are different, different than adults. Um, this is a woman telling a story about when she was a young girl. We lived in a duplex. The duplex is directly to the left and the right of us were aunts and uncles, were owned by aunts and uncles. The block directly to the east was all aunts and uncles. Across the street from us, all aunts and uncles. So there was no such thing as walking out and seeing a stranger. I just thought we all looked alike, we all had common ancestry, so what was the problem? Well, when I became mobile, when I got my first, when I got my, um, first tricycle, I could go a little bit further. So I ventured down the street and, you know, tooting around, being cool little neighborhood kid, waving to everybody, saying hi, and getting my little daily kisses. And I looked and I saw these, these couples sitting there, these two people. But they were people that I had never seen before. I had never seen anything like that because they were white people. And because I had never seen white people, I assumed that they were ghosts. So I waved, like, you know, I wonder if I wave, you know, what kind of people are they? What do they do? Do they talk? So I waved, and I remember hearing the man going. I remember this distinctly because it kind of scared me because I didn't really know what was going on. I heard, <coughs> I thought, wow, that must be the way they talk. <laughs> And being a child of Nova and the body in question and those kind of television shows, not really cartoony things, it was more like a scientific discovery. Like I discovered the first ghost people and they talked to me. They, I communicated. I waved. They waved. I said, you know, hello, and they coughed. You know, they said hello in their language. <laughs> So our show's been around almost 20 years. I've been there for four years. But, but um, back in the you know, first decade of the show or you know, the first years of the show, this was kind of the bread and butter. We did these very personal stories um, that you know, are lovely and tell you something about the world but aren't necessarily um, newsy. Um, but these days we cover the news all the time uh, or at least more serious topics. And what we've discovered over the years is you can take this format – this very simple, I'm just telling you this thing that happened to me at a bar or, you know, just over the phone chatting to a friend. And you can, you can apply it to a lot of different situations. Um, so here, I'm going to play you a clip uh, from a news event. This is from 2005 uh, when in the States we had Hurricane Katrina, which devastated New Orleans. Um, and the city was just totally in shambles for, you know, weeks afterwards. I mean, a long time afterwards. But especially in the weeks afterwards, people had nowhere to live, and, and people um, were mostly poor and mostly black. People were being held in um, the New Orleans Convention Center, uh, hundreds of people. Um, and so this, this, is, this is an interview our host Ira did with, uh, with Denise Moore. Um, she, was, she was taken to the convention center with her mother, her niece, and her niece's baby. When we got there, people were saying, you don't want to go in there. Did you go inside at all? Not until the next day. <laughs> What'd you see? Inside? Yeah. A sewer. A sewer, literally. Because I had to use the bathroom. And I was like, where's the bathroom? So I went inside. The whole place was a bathroom. And people were sitting close as they could to the doors, but the smell was overwhelming. So, so like, then what, what's, what do you do? Like, what's the best you can do? I actually stopped eating the minute we got there. I wouldn't eat or drink anything. Because I figured if you don't put nothing in, nothing's coming out. I was in the Army. <laughs> but yeah. even at that, I still had to use the bathroom. It was ridiculous. So what I ended up doing was getting a cup, going behind a partition, having a guy guard me while I was um, relieving myself in a cup behind some partition in the convention center. And then what my mom wanted me to make sure I tell you, what they kept doing the whole time was tell us to line up for the buses that never came. It was like they were doing drills every four hours. You all have to line up for the bus, and if you bum rush the bus, they're just going to take off without you, and nobody's going to get to go anywhere. You have to line up. You have to be in a straight line. We're talking about old people in wheelchairs and women with babies in lines waiting for buses that you know goddamn well aren't coming. 
like they were playing with us. And so I walked up to the so-called head guy in charge of our section, and I told him, I said, why do you have these people sitting out here in this sun? And you know these buses aren't coming. He was like, well, I know the guy who can make the call for the buses. I said, well, why hasn't he called them? And then he just walked away, and we were left there without help, without food, without water, without sanitary conditions, as if it's perfectly all right for these animals to reside in a freaking sewer like rats because there was nothing but black people back there. Yeah. And disposable. And then the story became, they left us here to die. They're going to kill us. You mean that's what people were saying to each other? Yeah. And is that what you believed? I was almost convinced. That, that basically... Because I kept having a vision of them opening that floodgate on us. Mm-hmm. Of my niece and her baby floating away from me, screaming. Mm-hmm. So by the time the rumor started that the National Guard was going to kill us, and I, I almost halfway believed it. And, and so people were saying, basically, they just brought us here, they're going to leave us here to die? Yeah, that's what we thought. The police kept passing us by. <laughs> And the National Guard kept passing us by with their guns pointed at us. And because they, they wouldn't, pa- when you see a truck full of water and people have been crying for water for a day and a night, and the water truck passes you by, just keeps going, how are we supposed to believe these people were here to help us? It was almost like they were taunting us. And then, don't forget, they kept lining us, us, us up for buses that never showed up. So again, it's the same thing as the other two stories. It's just someone saying what happened. What happened next? What happened next? How did you feel when that happened? Okay, then what happened? Um, but it's about something that w- that you know was incredibly important and and in the news. Um, I mean, something that we feel is important at the show is just to give people time to talk. Um, you know, in the days after Hurricane Katrina, there was all this breathless coverage. Uh, you know, especially on TV the host in the studio is talking to some reporter or anchor in the field who's at, or who's at the convention center, and the, repor- the reporter's doing most of the talking, right? The reporter's saying, I'm here, I'm looking at these people, and this is what's happening, and it smells really bad. I think Geraldo Rivera, like, there's a famous clip where he, like, holds a baby and cries, but it's him. It's not the people who are actually going through it. We heard 16 minutes of her talking, just 16 minutes of her just saying what happened, um, and that was, you know, a big part of, of the way we covered um, that event. And there's something about radio in particular, I think, um, and just letting people talk for a long time that lets you get inside the experience of it in a way that quicker sound bites and, and, um, you, you, you know, like shorter reporting, you learn what happened, you hear the facts, but you don't actually get your head inside of, of what it was like to live through that. Um, anyone have any questions before I move on? Please, seriously, raise your hand if, if, if you do. Yeah? Nobody uh, responds to that person who uh, lived through the situation and to say, this isn't true. You couldn't no one really believe this. Right. <laughs> you didn't uh, respond like that. I'm sorry? Sorry, uh, it's hard I'm to hear I'm trying you. to ask you yeah. if uh, you as a uh, head of uh, the host of the program mm-hmm. didn't respond to this person calling in and say, you couldn't really believe this. This couldn't Just happen. saying that sounds crazy. Yes, kind of. I think crazy. he may say it at some point in the okay. 16 minutes. Yeah, that's a, actually a common move that we'll pull is um, because obviously you're hearing it and thinking that and, and in the interview you want to be able to kind of be the proxy for the listener um, and so you want to just sit there and listen, you know, as, as you would. And when you feel something like that, when you say, when you think to yourself, this is crazy or unbelievable, it's good to express that in the interview because, you know, when you, you listen, you're going to think that. And, and it's nice to hear the host or the interviewer say that. I think it's somewhere in the interview, but not in the excerpt I've played. Okay. Um, so one thing I think that's different about our show than other news programs is that Primarily, we think of, our, of This American Life as an entertainment. Um, even if we're covering a serious topic, our first rule is it has to be entertaining. We will not air something just because it's important. That's, we feel like there are other, other places that do that. We air plenty of important stories on important topics, but that's not why we do it. It has to be entertaining in some way, surprising. It, needs to, it, needs to, it can't feel familiar. 
Um, and, and those are the criteria that we judge ideas on is you know, probably one of the most common reasons we don't do a story when it gets proposed to us or pitched to us is that it sounds familiar. Um, and that's, that's like a, a horrible word in our office. <laughs> um, and we, to make it an entertainment, we think about it as a show, as a play. I, actually, I wasn't a journalism major in school, I was a theater major. Um, and that's how we talk about our journalism. Um, and we use the tools of theater and movie making and TV to tell these, these true radio stories. And so uh, I just want to talk about a little, uh, two, of the, two of those tools. Um, two of the most important tools in any drama, which are character um, and stakes. Um, I'm going to play this clip. This is from a recent show we did. Uh, a bunch of us spent um, the month of October last year at uh, a car dealership outside of New York City. Um, and I don't know if it's the same here, but every, uh, in the States at least, every month, car dealerships have to make a certain quota um, or else they don't get their money, basically. So you need to sell, this month they had to sell 129 cars. And if they sold 129 cars, they got something like $90,000. If they sold 128 cars, they got $0. Um, and so we just followed them as they tried to make this, this goal. So here's... Here's the, this is the very beginning of that show. Freddie is the general manager of a car dealership these days, but he used to be a car salesman, and he was a good one, partly because he's got what he calls the gift for the gab. His go-to move in lots of situations is to finish a sentence and then laugh, even when the sentence is bad news. Like, here he is, assessing his chances of making his sales goal for the month. I'll give it a 50-50 right now because it's early. <laughs> Or this is him talking about a month when the car dealership did not make its sales goal. And I'm strictly commission, so I make nothing. <laughs> so when Freddie is not laughing, you know it's bad. And this October, Freddie did not laugh much at his weekly meetings with the guys who sell cars for him. All right, I just want to put... That, I think, is some of the most genius radio writing I've ever heard. So you see what he's doing there? So you're both... Lear this is the very beginning of the show. Um, so you're both learning about this character, about Freddy. You, I mean, you feel like you, this is 30 seconds, and you feel like you get to know this guy. But at the same time, um, you're also hearing about the stakes of the story, which are that he gets no money if he doesn't make this number. And so you're invested in the question of, is he going to make this number? Because I care if he makes money or not. I'm going to play it for you one more time. His go-to move in lots of situations is to finish a sentence and then laugh, even when the sentence is bad news. Like, here he is, assessing his chances of making his sales goal for the month. I'll give it a 50-50 right now because it's early. <laughs> or this is him. So there's a question. It's 50-50. You don't know if he's going to make it, right? <laughs> or this is him talking about a month when the car dealership did not make its sales goal. And I'm strictly commission, so I make nothing. <laughs> so, when Freddie... so now you know exactly what's at stake uh, in like 10 seconds. And you've also gotten to know this guy who's funny. Um, I mean, it, you can't always do it that elegantly, but um, you know, sometimes you have to do a lot more work to describe the stakes in writing. Um, but I think that's a that's a perfect example. Um, so then, so then we did a whole. Actually, this is like the longest podcast we've ever done. I mean, we're an hour on the radio, but on the podcast, we'll often put in material that we had to cut to make the hour-long radio uh, broadcast. And I think this podcast was like seventy-eight minutes or something like that. And we were able to sustain that much time on those stakes, the question of are they going to make this goal, and you just withhold the answer till the end of the month. I mean, it was like this great natural story. And in fact, that's why we chose the story. We wouldn't have chosen that story if there weren't those stakes. Like, we wouldn't have just sat around and watched someone at work necessarily unless we felt that there was some question that would hold your interest and make you wonder what's going to happen at the end of it. Um, so anyway, here's, here's, here's just a little more from that story. Um, Freddie's at one of their their weekly meetings, um, telling all the guys that they're not doing well enough, they're not selling enough cars, and he's been watching them through his security cameras. You know, I look through the video, I watch you guys in there, all on your computers, going to different websites, chilling. Dude, get on higher gear. This is no joke. I got to be at that number, or I'm telling you, I'm not going to be a nice guy. So put your nose right to the ground and come out shooting today. Everybody. I want balloons in all the departments. I want the radios down on. Put the convertible tops down all over the place. 
I want tons of balloons in the showroom. I just don't want one balloon to a car. Balloon the whole freaking place so it looks like a circus. Make it seem like we're having a monster sale and it's a party. Because we got to be at the big number by the 31st midnight. Period. No ands, ifs, and buts. So, everybody grabs balloons. Grown men inflate and tie and decorate. It's truism in their business. Balloons sell cars. And then, nobody shows up for an hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. Saturday should be one of their busiest days, and it's empty. Hey, Freddie, how's it going today so far? Shit. Really bad. (laughs) Really slow. Really, really slow. Early afternoon, Freddie told one of our producers, Brian Reed, that it was way slower than usual. I don't know if you can catch this, but try to notice the song that is playing over the radio in the background as they talk. What do you think it is? What's going on? Not a clue. With all the advertisements out there and everything else, we should be swamped. I'm stressing. Oh, I'm stressing. (laughs) Here's a little song I wrote. You might want to sing it note for note. Don't worry. Be happy. So imagine if that was, uh, if we were following, I don't know, like a sales or like a clerk at like the grocery store. There's no question. They're not, there's not, there's not some quota they're trying to make. Um, but you're engaged in hearing that because there's this question and, and there's a lot at stake. There's $90,000 at stake, whether or not they, they sell these cars. And so he's upset for good reason and you care about it, I hope. Um, yeah. Any questions about that or any thoughts about that? Um, so that's something we talk about with every story is, is what are the stakes? And the stakes can be, can be small. I mean, like in that first story with the guy, you know, mistaking the midget for the <laughs> nine-year-old, um, the stakes are very small and personal. He's embarrassed, <laughs> you know? But there's something, there's something there that's going to happen as a result of what you're hearing about. Um, I'm going to talk next about a story that's probably one of the hardest I've worked on. Um, it was about six months of my life. Um, it was about a guy named Oscar Ramirez. Um, he grew up in Guatemala. Um, he lives outside of Boston uh, in the States. He'd, he'd lived there for about a dozen years. Um, and then a, f- a few years ago, he got this phone call totally out of the blue from a war crimes prosecutor back in Guatemala. Um, and she said that when he was three years old, soldiers had gone to this village that he'd never heard of called Dos Eres back in Guatemala, um, and had massacred the entire village, all 200 people who lived there, um, except for two young boys who had been spared. And she thought that he was one of the boys. And he was totally shocked, obviously. Um, he had never heard of this town. Um, and also, like, he had a nice childhood. He didn't think this had happened to him. Um, and so he had a real hard time believing it. I was, like, confused. I didn't know what she, she was talking about. But she say, uh, I know you don't know much about it. Or you probably don't know anything about it. Because no. I was quiet. I was just listening to, to what she's saying. So they do a DNA test. And uh, sure enough, he was one of those boys. Um, the man who he, he thought was his father had actually been second in charge of this army squad um, that had killed his entire family, basically, and had, had massacred this whole village and then stolen him. Um, and, and, and that man's family had raised him as, as his own. But there was even more news. It actually turned out that Oscar's biological father happened to be out of town the day of the massacre and was alive. Um, and they found him living in the jungle. Mi nombre es Tranquilino Castañeda Valenzuela. My name is Tranquilino Castañeda Valenzuela. So here's a bit more from that story. Uh, you're going to hear the reporter. Her name is Habiba. Um, uh, telling a bit of Tranquilino's story. This is, this is Oscar's biological father. Tranquilino's pregnant wife was killed at Dos Eres. 
along with all of his children, nine of them, or so he thought. For 30 years, he's lived alone in the jungle. He never remarried after the massacre, never had another child. And in the middle of our interview, Trancolino interrupted with a request. Can I give the name of my children? Of course. Of course. Esther Castañeda. My firstborn was Esther Castañeda. Etelvina. The second one was Etelvina. Enma. Enma was the ah. third. Sí, está Maribel. After that was Maribel. She was around 13 when she died. Uno se llamaba Luz Antonio. De los mismos apellidos. Then it was uh, Luz Antonio, part of my sons. Mm -hmm. De ahí estaba César. Then it was César. Este, César tenía siete. César was seven years old. Y de ahí vinieron otras dos hembritas. Then two other girls. Odilia. Odilia. Rosalba. And Rosalba. Anyone else? Sí. Alfredo. Alfredo was Oscar's given name. Trancolino was out of town when those setas happened, visiting relatives. When he learned about the massacre, that everyone, including his wife and kids, had been killed. <laughs> Well, I, I, I got all crazy. Mire, mi situación es grande. Listen, I started to drink. Yo pensé ahogar las penas y que se podían nadar. I thought I could drown all my sorrows. But then I figured out that my sorrows could swim. stakes to this story, um, the fact that they were able to um, prove with DNA that Oscar was related to people at Dos Aires meant that Oscar became living evidence, basically, in the first trial to ever put away soldiers for a massacre 30 years ago in Guatemala. And so it had these intense personal stakes for Oscar, obviously, but also these very big geopolitical stakes as well for, for his country. Um, I'm going to play you one more selection from this story. Um, and it, I'm going to play it because it's an example of another thing we talk about a lot at the show. You know, we think of uh, our stories as, as movies kind of for the radio. And so we talk about scenes a lot. I think in broadcasting um, on the radio, especially a lot of times when people say scenes, they mean kind of ambient sound. So if I'm at a beach, I have sound of the water. If I'm at a protest, there's sound of the protest. We don't think of scenes that way. Um, we think of scenes as like in a movie where there's tension, drama, surprise, humor, and that's how we evaluate the stories and that's how we structure the stories is we, th we think about if you were watching them on a stage, you know, that's how we think about scenes. And so this is a scene where Tranquilino learns after 30 years that actually one of his sons is alive, Oscar. This is where he found out. Um, and you're gonna hear a few voices in this, in this, in this scene. Um, there's a forensic anthropologist and uh, also a human rights worker um, who told him the news. They asked him to come in person so they could tell him. Well, he hadn't been told because, you know, he's old. He's like 75. You don't, you know, you want to be careful with, with how, you, how you deal with this information. Uh, so when he was told, you know, I had a doctor standing by just in case, you know, he had a heart attack. Oh, yeah. I was afraid that, you know, he might uh, you know, be too excited about it or something. Bueno, se le dijo de que se había encontrado a, a Oscar. He was told that Oscar had been found, that a DNA test had been conducted, and that the results showed with 95% certainty that it was a match. And he would take his hat off, scratch his head, laugh, cry. He didn't know what to do because he wouldn't believe us. He thought that all his children were dead. What was he saying? 
es increíble, es increíble, es increíble. Incredible, incredible, incredible. Here's how Tranquilino remembers it. He has a different interpreter. First, uh, when they told me I wasn't happy, I was uh, s sad somehow, and then in a bit of a shock. And I remember that because they had to give me some hard liquor for me to come back to my senses because I was in a bit of a shock. If that wasn't enough to handle, there was more. One of the anthropologists walked in with a laptop. She turned on Skype, and there on the screen, sitting in Massachusetts, was Oscar. We were there talking. She pulled my chair. She put it next to her. She grabbed me hard, and then she said, do you know the person, the young man on the screen? And, she, and I said, no, I don't know who that is. And then she said, it's your son. I said, not him. And then I couldn't speak anymore. I couldn't speak anymore. Yeah, when when we first see each other, he couldn't talk. He was just crying, and he said, I can't talk. Oscar just sat there, looking at Tranquilino. He didn't know what to say. Oscar was just three when he was taken from Dos Eras. Seeing this man triggered nothing for him. No memories. The first thought that he had was that Tranquilino looked really old. It was hard to believe that this was his father. Then Tranquilino spoke. He said, uh, Alfredo. That was the first word that he said, Alfredo. And I said, yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm Alfredo. That name was familiar to Oscar because it's his middle name. The lieutenant kept it for him. He also kept Oscar's original last name which is Tranquilino's last name, Castaneda. So Oscar realized that his full name, Oscar Alfredo Ramirez Castaneda, is a combination of his biological dad's name and his Kaibil dad's name. Tranquilino kept talking. He told Oscar that he was chubby as a kid, which was true. Oscar was chubby as a kid. Tranquilino told him he used to boss around his siblings even though they were older than him. To this day, Oscar says, that's still true. He is bossy. But the thing that really hit Oscar in the gut was something that was a mystery to him as a little kid. He told me that I didn't have my teeth. And that was true. I didn't have my teeth for a long time. Until he was eight or nine, he was missing a bunch of teeth. He says he looked like Dracula. Tranquilino told him his teeth had been rotten when he was young, so they had to pull them out. When he said that, what did what went off in your head? Then I started to, you know... Exactly, this is true. This is really happening. Um, so I've had a lot, actually, a few people come up to me um, about after this story aired, and they said things like, wow, it was amazing that you were there when Tranquilino found out about his son and talked to him on Skype. You were there for that moment. And, <laughs> and I have to tell them, like, no, we weren't there. Um, we just talked to every person who was um, and had them tell us the story from their perspective. And you've heard, you know, you hear four people who were in the room when this happened um, each tell their part of it. And it feels like you're there. I mean, it, it's a great compliment to get, I, to, uh, to get when people um, come up and say that to me. Um, but that's like a trick that we use all the time. You know, if you identify a scene in your story, so we're given this story, we kind of know the outlines of it, um, and we know that there's this incredible meeting that happened on Skype, like we just heard about it through our pre-reporting. And so we set out to find everyone we could who's in that room and sat them down, flew to Guatemala, you know, went up to Boston, and, and had them walk us through it over and over again just so we had all the details that we could. Um, and then at each point to say, how did you feel? That's crazy. How did you feel when you, when you saw your son on the, on the screen? You know, and he says, I didn't feel happy. I don't really know what I felt, you know. Um, and, uh, again, that's like the basic structure from the first clips as well, um, using a much larger, this was an hour-long story. Um, any questions? Anyone want to say anything? Seriously, yeah. Hi. I think there's a mic. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, I was just thinking, you know, obviously it would be ideal if you were there for the moment mm -hmm. and you probably came into the story afterwards and had to recreate it like you did. Mm -hmm. I, I suppose Yeah, that was the case. Um, but did you consider at any point to bring these people, you know, physically together to recreate that moment? To recreate it? Did you, I mean, have... Was it um, they? I mean, there were a, a lot choice of to interview them separately, Oscar and his father, or have you, during the course of this story, actually brought them together in um, the same place? There were there were things in motion to do that. Um, there were a lot of moving parts just to the reality of this story. Um, you know, Tranquilino is very old and has some some you know a lot of problems. Uh, you know, mental health issues from the trauma he suffered. Um, and from some alcoholism. So anyway, there were there were the work the human rights workers were planning on bringing him to the United States to meet Oscar, but that was kind of a moving target and and constantly changing, just depend on depending on a lot of different factors. Uh, it wasn't really our place to kind of orchestrate that. They had they were going to do that when the time was right, basically, and they did do it actually. That the, so the week that our story aired, um, Tranquilino came to. Um, the U.S. and met Oscar for the first time, and we considered pushing it back a week um, just to be there for that moment. Um, but honestly, we 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 decided that this was kind of special enough, um, and it wouldn't like hearing about him getting the news is exciting. And he's already gotten the news when he meets Oscar for the first time. They're going to be talking in Spanish, you know. Um, and so we ended the story by saying, this week they're going to meet for the first time. And it felt just as exciting, um, I think. You know? But we did have a serious discussion to answer your question about waiting and like holding the show off just to kind of be there for them to meet for the first time. Um, but we felt like you know, having this scene this way was just as powerful. Um, anything else? Any other questions? Hi, I think it's, sorry, it's a little hard to see, so just shout or something. <laughs> Hi, oh, this is fascinating. I, I know you're super uh, established now. Do the stories come to you, or do you go out looking? Both, both. I mean, we're lucky. We get a lot of people pitching, um, but finding stories is like a full-time job. It's a huge part of the job. It's something like I need to get, I, I personally would like to get better at. Um, we get a lot of people pitching us stories. I would say rarely does someone pitch a story and as they've pitched it is the story we're gonna do. Um, you know, a lot of the work is reading through pitches and finding the story in the pitch. You know, sometimes pe someone will pitch a very large kind of breathless investigative piece about something and again, it'll feel a little familiar, like we've read an investigation into something to do with the army or the war or something, but there's some scene or some character that they mention in the, in the pitch and we say, oh, that could be a fun or interesting smaller piece. And so it's a lot of that. Um, and then, so I'd say more than half of our stories come from outside pitches. Um, but then we come up with you know, ideas on our own. We look for stories, we read local newspapers. And then a lot of our best, most exciting stories, I think, come out of just questions we have about the world. You know, we have a lot of, we've done a lot of economic reporting and uh, some of those stories just came out of questions like, wait, what happened? Why did the economy collapse? And just trying to answer a very basic question. Um, so it's a variety of things. Uh, I hope that, hope that answers your question. Um, anything else? Anyone else? Someone up here? Hi, thank Hi. you. I love your show. Oh, um, thank you. I was just wondering that, I mean, a lot of people, they have good stories, but they're not always good storytellers. How do you help them to tell their story in an entertaining way? That's a very, very good question. Um, something I, hope, I was hoping to get to. So the invisible thing, if you listen to our show, um, a lot of people say, where do you find these stories? They're so, they're so good. We kill so many stories. It's, it's like, that's another big part of the job, is, is, is evaluating whether or not we're going to air something. Um, and a lot of times we'll kill it on the fact that someone isn't a good storyteller. That's one of the like, major reasons why we will not air something. Um, and so we'll do pre-interviews with people. So if someone says, like, oh, this person has a fun story, um, you know, like the first story I played with the guy at the office with the, with the nine-year-old, um, 
you know, maybe someone that's someone's friend, you know, and, and they say that he has this funny story. We'll call them on the phone, one of us, and just have them kind of tell it to us. And if it's not fun or funny, we just won't do it. Um, or sometimes we will do the interview, and it's not fun or funny, and we won't use it. Um, sometimes we will travel and work on something for two months, and the interviews are not great, and people aren't great storytellers, and we won't use it. We have luckily have that luxury at this point. What's that? Sorry. Do you meet them before you talk to them, or do you uh, let them tell their story their own way? I mean, yeah, a good interview, you know, a good interview, the interviewer kind of draws it out of you. I mean, some people are natural storytellers, obviously, and they're, and they're great. Um, it depends on the story. So something like this, where Oscar has to be the character, like this happened to Oscar, right? You can't just substitute in any old storyteller. It's such a crazy story that, he, you know, even though his English isn't great, he's not the most natural storyteller in English. Um, it's good enough and the circumstances are incredible enough that with writing and the other characters around him, you can bring it to life. And so if someone is in a unique position, yeah, you just work your hardest to ask them questions over and over again and just to get them to say it a lot of times and the taking the best bits from each time they say it and putting it together in the most compelling way. Um, but if it's a more personal story and it just relies on one person um, and they're not a good storyteller, we just won't use it and we'll try and find you know another another story does that, does that answer your question i hope yeah, thank you it's just about it's a lot of like being discerning basically and acknowledging when something is boring and not airing it if it is that's kind of the the crux of it hey hi um hi i work for a newspaper but you make me love radio oh <laughs> thank you um yeah uh, i've been a big fan for a long time so uh, a part of me don't want to ask this question mm -hmm. but I'll, I'll still do it because i'm yeah. curious um in 2012 you had the um uh, the apple factory um mm -hmm. show where you you and the audience were fooled by this mr um, mr daisy uh, mm -hmm. with the full supporting can you can you tell us a, a, bit, a little bit about how that changed if it changed the way you work at all and, and how it affected the whole uh, This American Life uh, mm -hmm. stab, because I, I think I listened to one of your colleagues uh, two or three years back in Norway, and this was just after the incident, and it felt like you were going through a, a rough time at that point. Uh, yeah, it sucked. <laughs> um, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, so we aired a story that was told by a, um, a theater performer named Mike Daisy um, about a a trip he took to uh, Shenzhen in China to, to where Apple products are made. Um, and it turned out, we found out from a reporter in China who dug into it after it aired that um, there were some serious fabrications in his story that we hadn't caught, and so we had to retract it. Um, and the biggest change is that we have like a, a fact-checking department now. That's like the, the most kind of succinct Answer and you know we, we did our own fact checking before, which I don't know what the standard is here, but in public radio and at most newspapers in the states, I mean very few places actually have fact checkers. You know it's it's reporters doing their own fact checking, which we did but didn't do well enough on that story, um, and so now we have you know separate fact checkers who we've hired, um, and we run everything through them. Um, yeah, does that? That's honestly like the, that's the biggest change, you know. I was thinking about, yeah. I mean, the confidence of, of the show, of the people who worked there as well. Um, I mean, we were upset, I mean, obviously. And I worked on that show. I was very upset that it happened, and I felt um, that we owed, you know, a retraction to our audience. And uh, we did that. We put in, like, the two weeks. We spent, a, we, we spent and the show was an hour, the original show, and then we did an hour-long retraction. We felt that the retraction should be as long as the mistake. Um, and uh, and then you just move on, kind of. I mean, you know, I'm definitely even more diligent. It's, it doesn't feel good to be lied to. Um, but I also feel responsible as well. So, um, but no, we're feeling, I think we're, I think we're past it at this point. I think we're all right. Um, anyone else out there? Hi. Hi. 
I, I think it's very interesting to see how the radio keeps going on with all these new platforms. But I'm wondering how much do you work with other other platforms? Like, for instance, this uh, story about mm -hmm. Oscar. Do you also make a web version and a written written version on this? Um, do you bring a web camera? Um, yeah. How normally, do you normally no. Um, normally, we're just we're a radio show and a podcast. Um, and just to make that is so much work <laughs> that we don't do much else. Um, though, how, however, with this story, um, we collaborated with, a, with an investigative reporting outfit called ProPublica, and so there was a print version. We, we published an ebook in collaboration with them. But it was kind of like we were working side by side. So we were making the radio version of the same story, and they were making the print version, and we featured that on our website, and they linked to us. Um, but it was a team of, you know, there were four reporters um, on that story. So two of us did the radio story, and two, uh, you know, the other two did the did the ebook. But the report it was based on the same reporting. So we were, we did our our interviews a lot of times together and our fact gathering together, and then went and crafted the the final product separately. Um, but honestly, like we we're lucky to have a good audience on the radio, and so that's what we focus on. Um, and then you know, now and again, if like something seems to lend itself to some other format. We'll put something on the web or something like that. Uh, we have a live show coming up uh, in New York, so that we'll do things like that as well that we find fun. Um, anyone else have a question? Yeah. Hold, he's bringing the mic over, sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, mm. you talk a, l a lot about good storytelling, but could you explain a bit more about what makes good storytelling good? What makes good storytelling good? You mean like a, ta a good talker? Yeah. How do you uh, um, help somebody become a good storytelling? Do you mean a reporter become a good storyteller or, or, or an interview, the, interview uh, subject? Interview subject. An interview subject? Yeah. Um, how do you, I mean, first of all, it has to be an interesting story. So the story itself needs to have surprise or a moment of revelation or emotion in it. So that's step one is choosing a good story. Um, I think some people have the idea that like radio is about the idea that everyone has a story to tell and we just can interview anyone and put their story on the air and that is could not be farther from the truth. Like, So it's a lot of like thinking before you do the interview, is this story good? And then when you do the interview, at least you've, you've crossed that threshold. Um, and then it's just asking a lot of questions over again. Like we do a lot of repeating questions in different ways if we feel like we haven't got it. Um, you know, our, our normal interview time is an hour and a half, roughly to two hours for, and that could be for a segment that's five to 12 minutes. Um, and so we just ask a lot of questions and we try to try different things. Um, and then uh, some other good advice that I've heard somewhere, I know Ira says this, but um, is, is an interview is a party, basically. And your interview subject is not gonna be, is not gonna have more fun than you're having, basically. You know, you're not gonna be sitting there bored and they're gonna be really excited. I mean, you know, you have to be excited, you have to be engaged, you have to listen. Um, like I do, when I'm in interviewing someone in person, I'm, I do a lot of nodding. Um, if someone says something that I like, you know, um, in print, you can just kind of like, if you're not recording it, and you're a print reporter, you can kind of say like, oh yeah, tell me more about that, blah, blah, blah. But on the radio, if they're in the middle, if they're in a groove and they're, and they're going, I'll sometimes go, <laughs> you know? Um, I'll let them know that they're doing a good job and, and egg them on. Um, it's intuitive, I mean, it's like, it's also a, a lot of listening and, and thinking about what parts are the best and do you have enough to make the story go? And then if you feel like you, you don't, you go back at the end and ask questions. The other secret with radio is that you know, we often have, if I was interviewing someone, there's at, le at least one producer listening in, and at the end, that person is another set of ears jotting down questions that maybe Ira didn't think of or the interviewer didn't think of, and at the end, that person will jump in and suggest those questions. So you've got two brains on it as well. That's, so that helps. I hope that answers your question. It's a hard thing to talk about. I'm realizing, <laughs> um, if you're not there. Any other questions? Secrets. 
so hard to see. Oh, over here. Hi. Hi. I was just wondering, how many people work in, in the show? Um, we just grew a little bit. We're about 15 people. I don't know the exact number, but it's pretty small. And that we just had three people start, so you know we were even smaller. Um, that, that's all? That was an easy one. Um, <laughs> let me play one more piece of tape. Um, what would be interesting? Do you guys n know what the price is right over here? Are you guys familiar with that show? Tell me no if you're not. It's just a game show. All right, I'm not going to play that then. <laughs> um, what should I play? Um, you want to hear it? OK. Yeah. Price is Right is just a game show where you like bid on, it's a famous game show in the States uh, that's on during the day. It's been around forever. The host is now Drew Carey. And uh, and you just bid on the price of some prize, and, and whoever's closest to it without going over wins the prize. So this aired like a, a week or two ago. We did a whole show. We'll do experiments sometimes. Um, so a couple weeks ago, we did a whole show called I Was So High about drugs. Um, and uh, as part of that, we asked our listeners uh, if they had any good drug stories um, and to, to write us. We got like almost 3,000 <laughs> entries, I believe. And this, this speaks to kind of what I've been talking about with kind of figuring out the story's good before you do the interview. Um, so we got 2,600 entries. I think, I think the producer's working on that. I did not work on this directly, but did 40 interviews, and we used one. That's how many we had to go through, and it took that many weeks. Um, and go, you know, we read through every one of those entries, and this is the one that we thought was good enough to put on the air. So this is a guy named Josh uh, who ate some hallucinogenic mushrooms and then went to see The Price is Right, a live studio taping. Already, without mushrooms, it would have been crazy. Here it comes! Because literally old people are dancing with children in the aisles. This, this one old lady starts, like, booty dancing on Drew Carey. There are just dollar signs and flashing lights. I mean, everybody's going crazy. They, we were, like, demonstrably the least high-looking people there. Television's most exciting hour of Fantastic Prizes, the fabulous 60-minute prize is live! It was so just awe-inspiring seeing all the colored lights that I didn't actually hear come on down. Joshua Androsky, come on down. All of a sudden, I looked on the stage and there was this PA uh, who was holding up a sign with my full name on it which was really, really scary, because in my head, it wasn't like, Josh Androsky, come on down. In my head, that sign was, Josh Androsky, we know that you're here. But, you know, it, there was that light bulb that went off my brain that was like, oh my God, I'm gonna play the prices right now. Uh, let's get the show started with the first prize of her bids today on The Price is Right. Excellent idea, Drew. We're gonna start off with a new home theater system. I was the first person to bid on the first prize on contestants row. Goes to whoever is closest to the actual retail price without going over. Uh, Big Papa, we're gonna start with you. And I'm an idiot, and I bid a dollar every time. <laughs> For that, I'm gonna bid one dollar. <laughs> one dollar! All right, Big Papa bids a dollar. Big Papa hat, Dolly Parton shirt, bid a dollar. <laughs> I'm a mystery, dude. We have to an enigma, get used to it. Miraculously, one of the $1 bids worked, and I got up, and then Drew Carey was like, hey, okay, cool, what do you do? But that's when, like, all the mushrooms hit me at once, and I, and I just looked at him and I said, uh, I'm a skateboard rabbi. <laughs> skateboard rabbi. Uh... Drew Carey turns to me and goes, how do you incorporate skateboards into Judaism? I, I was like, well... Drew Carey, we go to local high schools and attempt to turn religious extremism into religious extremism. Now, unfortunately, they cut it out of the show. I get it. <laughs> I get it. But if you watch the video, the studio audience is going crazy, and Drew Carey looks right at the camera and goes, 
He really is a skateboard rabbi. <laughs> so that's that. Um, that's hot off the presses. It's last week's show. Um, so yeah, I guess, yeah, a lot of the questions have been like, how do you get a good interview? Honestly, like I would say that is the work, is going through the 2,600 ideas and then interviewing the 40 people to get that. Like you have to do all that in order to get that. That's the work that goes into an interview. You don't just sit down and like, I, I don't know, at least I don't, like just interview someone. There's so much work that goes into calling people, seeing how they talk, seeing what the story is, and tr even trying it in the studio and then, and then not being afraid to not use it. Um, so I think we just have a few, like two more minutes if anyone has a last question. I see two hands, so you here and there, yeah. Hi. What about ethical discussions? Uh, do you have that in the, uh, in the radio s discussions? Uh, yeah, of course. If you need to protect people against themselves? <laughs> against themselves, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we'll kill stories because of that. I mean, just like any other journalist, we have those discussions all the time. Um, I'm yeah. thinking spe specifically yeah. about Oscar oh. and what happened to him if everything yeah. the world knows about him and what's coming out of it. Uh, what's come out of it is he actually was granted asylum in the United States. I mean, we worked closely with his lawyer, who was protecting him quite a bit, and it took us months to even get a first interview with him, um, and for him to be comfortable to do it, and for his lawyer to be comfortable to do it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was just, you know, it's the work of any, you know, normal reporter, like getting to know a source, gaining trust, and, uh, and then eventually doing the interview. And it worked out for him. So basically, it's very dangerous because he's this living evidence. His DNA is evidence. Um, it's dangerous for him to go back to Guatemala. There are people who do not want that evidence out there um, who stand to, uh, you know, some of these guys have been sentenced for 6,060 years for this massacre, you know, a life sentence for every victim. Um, and they're in jail now, and there are other people at large still. And so and it's dangerous father, for him to go back. And his uh, adopted father, yeah. <laughs> what happened to him? He visited, um, and I believe he's, I haven't talked to them in a little while. This was a couple of years ago we did this story, but. Oh, I think about the general yeah. who took him from. Oh, he death. died. He died. He's been de dead for a while. So actually Oscar was raised by that man's mother okay. uh, for a large part of his childhood. Um, yeah, it's a complicated story. A lot of ins and outs. Thank you. Yeah. Is there was one back there or either of you guys? Hi. Um, Hi. I just, I was wondering, because I'm a big fan of your show, and I have oh, your app you. on my phone, and it cost me like $2, <laughs> I think, which is yeah. awesome. Yeah, 2 maybe? Yeah. yeah, something like that. Yeah. Um, and obviously, you've grown as an organization. I'm just wondering, because it takes a lot of resources now to make your stories. Mm -hmm. So can you just say a couple of words about funding? About funding? Um, l luckily, I don't have to think about that in my job so much uh, on the editorial production side, but um, uh, we're, we're public radio, but we don't get, it's not like here, I don't think, I mean, we don't get money from the government, our show at least. Um, it's a complicated system where all of our public radio stations around the country are independent and then they buy the programming that they want from NPR, which is like our NRK, or Public Radio International, kind of different. Um, public media organizations, um, but basically we're listener supported. You know, If you like public radio, you donate to your local station, and then the local station pays us a fee to air our show based on their mar the size of their market. And then we also have our podcast, um, which is outside of our radio revenue. And, and so we'll, we'll just go on the podcast once a year or something and say, hey, if you like this podcast, it's free. Text us this number, and it sends us $10, um, and that does quite well for us. So it's a, it's a cool model and it makes us feel good that people like what we're doing <laughs> um, to send 10 bucks or whatever. Uh, I hope that answers your question. I don't know a ton of, of the ins and outs of that. Yeah, that's yeah. a good answer. We yeah. have the same. It's well, similar. It's listener supported here too, except it's not voluntary. Right. <laughs> you have to pay a exactly. license. Yeah, you guys have like a licensing fee. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we don't have that. I don't think that would fly in the States. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Was there was one other hand back there? Sorry, it's very hard to see all the way back there. No, did I imagine it? Um, cool. If there's anyone else who has a question, I'm happy to, to answer, but I don't know if they're going to kick me off. Oh, sorry. Hey. This guy's going to work out. <laughs> I was just wondering, you, you've been doing this show for a while, and this show is, mm -hmm. like, how many years was it? 20 years old? Oh, going on 20. 19. And this festival has been a lot about how how yeah. media change and how do the audience, uh, how does the mm -hmm. habits of the audience change. Have you noticed any significant changes in the way we consume radio? Has there been any changes? Like I mean, we have a third of our audience is on the podcast. So we have three million listeners in total, roughly, and a million of those download the podcast, which to me is just like, you know, on-demand TV or something. Um, other than that, I, not, not that I know of. <laughs> um, it, you know, just people want to listen when they want to listen, just like with TV. That's like the main thing. I've noticed. Yeah, nothing with length or types of stories or we haven't changed our types of stories for that reason at all. I mean, we've changed as producers. I think as a staff, we've got more interested in in more serious topics and bigger questions. But I don't think it has anything to do with like the changing face of media. It's just us as people <laughs> um, being interested in new and different things and doing stories about it. Yeah, that was good. Uh, thank you guys. Thanks for listening.